Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat. I uh, appreciate uh, you being with me this morning. I'm delighted and an honor to uh, have my two guests with me this morning, uh, Pierre Benoit and uh, De Hamel and uh, David de Grégoire from uh, Soutitreur. And uh, Soutitreur is a closed captioning company, is uh, based in Quebec. Uh, I'm uh, proud and happy to be joined by these two innovators and two gentlemen in our uh, localization industry that are making a difference in the way we see closed captioning and today and in the future. Um, before I uh, get started, our localization fireside chat is available on YouTube and it's also available on Spotify. Uh, you just have to search for the localization fireside chat in YouTube and you'll find our channel. I invite everybody to subscribe, comment, like, share the videos as you see uh, fit and necessary. Thanks so much. So let's start with a round of introduction. Um, we'll start by uh, David. Uh, David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about the organization, and then we'll go to Pierre Benoit. All right, man. thanks for the introduction, uh, Robin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, fireside chat. Uh, so my name is David Gregoire. Um, I've been a digital marketer my whole life, and I just happen right now to have a quite successful business in the local, localization industry and closed captioning. Uh, and this is the company I manage every day now uh, for three years now. So I'm having lots of fun uh, playing in that industry, which was new for me, as I said, because I'm more of a digital marketer. And one of your interesting, I read your a little bit about your bio. One of the interesting thing that you've, you've done many interesting things, and it was surprising to me, is you founded an airline company. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I've been working uh, more than six years as vice president of technology and marketing for the largest online travel agency in Quebec. We had sales of about $100 million per year uh, online in Canada only and in French. So uh, it was quite a big uh, travel agency. And when I left, um, I launched other companies. And uh, this was the guy that already had an airline, a small airline. Uh, and wanted to do um, trips to the Caribbean. So uh, we started a new airline together and um, I left the company right before COVID. Like, I'm really lucky because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the industry uh, really suffered from uh, COVID. And now uh, the airline is going well. It's called OWG and uh, it makes flights to, uh, as far as I know right now, Cuba only. Uh, it was an interesting project. Uh, I traveled a lot for that company. And, uh, you know, I always thought that there was um, one or two ways to be really rich in life, uh, having a pharmaceutical uh, company or having an airline. So <laughs> that's why I launched it. <laughs> Well, hopefully you achieved uh, you achieved one the founding of the company. I'm hoping that you're Bars. rich. <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, David, I understand you're in uh, Puerto Rico right now. You were, we were talking just before we started recording here that you're in Puerto Rico. And you know, t true to a digital nomad, uh, by the way, to the audience, David worked from anywhere. Uh, anywhere there is a connection, you can see David. You know. Uh, like the rest of us in the localization industry, especially during COVID and after COVID, you know, plugging your laptop and accessing and, and doing business, whatever you happen to be. Uh, would you mind showing the audience where you are right now? I just want to make everybody jealous. <laughs> look at this uh, blue look, beach. Look at this blue uh, water. Incredible. I love that. <laughs> but maybe you didn't know, uh, Robin, but uh, right before we met uh, months ago, I was coming back from a 14 month road trip across Europe with my four kids. So we did 30 countries in Europe and I was working, building the company every now and then. And uh, during the school year, we stopped in, in Italy so that they could, the kids could go to school. And I, I had the chance to have an office and a stable internet connection to uh, to be working for the, these months. What a, but yeah, what I'm, an interesting, I'm a big traveler. You know, building, building a company while you're on the road, David, I'm just trying to survive. You're building a company <laughs> while you're, 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 you're vacationing. I, have, I love that. <laughs> I have good partners and uh, a good team working with me too. So it helps a lot. Excellent, excellent. Uh, just to, if you don't mind, I'd just like to move on to uh, Pierre Benoit. Yeah. Pierre Benoit, tell us a little bit about yourself as uh, an introduction and uh, what drove you to connect with David? How, how did you two come together and you know, the idea, evolution, etc. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Robin, for uh, for having me this morning. Um, so I joined David approximately two years ago in this uh, endeavor of Sudstrar, closedcaptioner.com. 
Uh, Dave and I are longtime friends. Uh, we've known each other for 15 years now. We should celebrate that, actually. We haven't celebrated <laughs> it. You're right. Um, and uh, in the, so I'm from a retail background. I've developed a luxury retail business. And uh, during COVID, David came to me and uh, we had a conversation. He had started Suitstar. It was taking off. Um, the business was already thriving, but uh, there were you know, some challenges, challenges in terms of uh, liberating him from different tasks and making sure we could put a proper team in place, uh, you know, and a, a proper financial structure in order to uh, really make it explode. So I made the big jump and joined David as a partner and, uh, you know, executive VP to uh, grow the team, grow the business, uh, make sure we can provide quality in the various languages that we serve. Um, and that's that's what my role is in this. David is always the fantastic ideas man, the technical, you know, technological developments. He's always, you know, through, I'd say three steps ahead in terms of what we can develop, what we can do in the system to whether it optimizes the quality to the customer or optimizes the uh, I call it work environment, even though we have currently about 5000 freelancers worldwide that log into our system to do work. Well, their work environment is the platforms, you know, how they do the transcription, how we optimize by um, by automating certain parts of the work. So that's David's ideas. And we take all this, put it together to have a business that's a solid, quality driven and consistent. Excellent. Now, you you two, uh, you know, when David came up with the idea, and uh, you two are friends for a long time, and uh, what was your first reaction, Pierre Benoit, to the idea? What, what did you first initial reaction? Yeah. Oh, my God, when what are you thinking? Or <laughs> when Initially, uh, I remember him telling me we, we, we had gone hiking in, uh, in Sutton, near, near where uh, David lives. And he said, oh, well, you know, I started this thing. We're doing subtitles. There are people that are logging in, doing it. And... Uh, I think back then he used to dispatch the jobs via email and uh, and I was sort of a little bit skeptical as to, okay, is there really a market for this? And uh, when he spoke to me six months later, he said, okay, now it's really going well. And uh, with a bigger scope and better researched, I realized that uh, it's a thriving industry that with the growth of video online and via multi-platforms, Netflix, Prime, whatever video content is out there that is expen exponentially growing with the counter fact that people are watching on mobile devices and therefore not listening to sound so they need the captions to be on the video right. in order to understand the message mm -hmm. so it's created a, an industry that's thriving and is only in a growth phase right now Excellent. Uh, David when you um, worked in other industries I mean obviously you are not in localization, but you probably saw an opportunity in localization. Uh, how did that come about? Like, what was the spark, if you will, that says, well, actually, okay, yeah. I see an opportunity here? It wasn't supposed to be a business, Robin. I have to admit, I, I have other businesses and I just wanted to create videos for my other businesses. And I know uh, for certain, because I'm a digital marketer, that People, they don't interact with videos online if they are in a situation where they cannot put the sound on. For example, you are in the bed with your, um, your spouse, you are at the restaurant, or you could be anywhere else. The thing is, you're not going to interact with the video you see because you don't have the time and uh, you, don't, you cannot put the sound on. And anyways, you don't want to interact anyways. But if you want to cap attention, you need to put captions so that people would read it. And this... I already understood that years ago when I was creating videos. But then when I started again after launching the airline right at the beginning of COVID, um, I needed to put captions on my videos and there was no affordable solution to create captions in French. There was okay. one in English. There was no affordable solution in French. You would have to contact a cinema company. Uh, so the, it, the process was complicated for a small entrepreneur like me, like, you know, small business, really, really small business. So what I did is I hired someone full-time to write my captions for me. And um, weeks after, I, I was not producing enough videos to keep him busy full-time. So I, I asked other marketer friends, do you have videos to caption? And then from there, 
I had no choice but to create a website because people were sending me videos and money and everything. And there was no way to manage all this. <laughs> and uh, little did I know that weeks later, we would be 50, 100, 500, 5,000 freelancers and a whole bunch of clients everywhere in the world to, um, to uh, send us videos to caption. You know, most of, uh, most of the videos we do are for social media. It's not all of what we do, but most of it, because um, it's the, you know, localization before uh, social media was so big, was more for the deaf, uh, for people that cannot hear. And it was a, an expense, but right now, uh, it's for, for these people and also for the rest of the world that can hear perfectly, but you want your videos to be uh, displayed to them and, and listened by them and watched by them. So you need to put captions right now is the, one of the, the only things that you can do for accessibility that also is uh, profitable for a company. So I think that's, that's why this has been so successful up to now. But to come back to your question, I never thought it would be a business by itself, honestly. <laughs> you know, they say the need is the mother of all inventions. So there is a exactly. need, you created an invention and the invention turned to a, to a profitable company, which congratulations for this. And uh, uh, which, you know, I mean, it, I keep talking about this and you and I have talked about this topic before is that the uh, innovation and the passion that is combined together uh, in the localization industry in general, or, or in entrepreneurs such as yourself, David, um, it is amazing what you can produce out of that. Um, and, and I'm speaking in general, obviously, and you're an example of this, is that, you know, when you have a uh, passion to do something, and your, your passion is business in this case, you saw an opportunity to develop something to solve a problem. And, you know, at the time, as you mentioned, it, it, it was a problem, you know, dubbing and dubbing was, you know, complex uh, complex task that people need to do, need to use in their in their videos, etc. You said, okay, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to make it easier for people to do um, a dubbing for their own uh, for their own uh, 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 for their own videos and 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 closed captioning. So, going to this, I mean, I'm thinking here of the news that came out on Slater, and I'm going to dig into it a little bit with uh, uh, maybe Pierre Benoit could take this one on um, the. Um, Mr. Beast and the launching of the, his own dubbing company. Uh, wondering what's your comments uh, on this one? Like, again, this is a creator, a video creator uh, who is, he's got like several million subscribers. So obviously an influence, ob obviously an influencer and probably works with you or not. I don't know, but what do you think of him launching the, uh, uh, the, the initiative that he's doing? So I, I just want to put in perspective before we talk about dubbing and closed captioning and subtitles. So David, let's, let's define I, that. Let's def good idea. Let's define it. The, yeah, we are in the closed, closed captioning, captioning and yep. the subtitle business. We do not currently offer the service of dubbing at scale like we do in subtitles. Um, I can understand Mr. Beast wanting to, uh, for especially for dubbing, to control his own uh, voices, his own quality, and at the scale that they are at to have whether an internal team or to have a business in it, it would make sense for him for his um, his contact, his content per se. Now to do it at scale on the other part is a completely different business and uh, they probably have a good team in place to structure it, to launch it. And uh, I think we wish him, you know, a great success with that. Were you were you aware, uh, Robin, that uh, Mr. Beast, uh, prior to launching this dubbing committee, has launched the biggest uh, restaurant of hamburgers of uh, the USA? <laughs> did, did you know that? No, I read about him, and I uh, yes, I was aware of that, but I didn't know, you know, the, the again entrepreneurs. I mean, you're you're a great example, David. He, you come up with an idea and the fundamentals is, is there a business in here? And if the answer is yes, does the product matter? And the answer is no, typically no, because as long as there is an, there is a business opportunity somewhere, you would just go in and you develop it. Uh, in this case, yeah, I heard about his, uh, uh, you know, burger chain, burger chain, <laughs> yeah, but I, um, but with all due respect uh, to him and to everybody um, uh, who is content creators, um, there are sometimes, especially for the, um, 
especially for the content creators such as myself, you know, starting new uh, in a channel and you want to uh, you want to take that channel to multiple demographics in a variety of way, you know, closed captioning or dubbing or whatever, whatever means that you probably want to use. Um, there, there is a there is a gap there. And you guys, um, you know, I know I've had this conversation before, you know, not necessarily everybody has like that million dollar budget that want to go and do things in a in a in a million dollar budget you know, quote unquote, uh, criteria, but some people like want to get things done, you know, quickly put them on social media. And as you know, and as I know, uh, content has an expiry date, has a shelf life, uh, for that yeah. short shelf life, you don't want to spend too much money. Anyhow. Well, actually, uh, it is an interesting debate, um, because you have covered two interesting points. You're talking about the shelf life of the content that is produced today, but what we see uh, in the market is people creating content like like the podcast we are recording today uh, together. And then after that, this content um, doesn't have an expiry date. We could use part of this content again and again and again. For example, just a sentence that I just said, uh, right now we could make a short clip, sure. put it on, yeah. on TikTok, yep. and we could put it back on TikTok in one year from now. Different yep. people would see it and it mm -hmm. would be still uh, pertinent in that Valid. time. Yeah. So, so yeah, the content that you create today could be used and can be used and should be used in multiple formats in the future. You just have to have the discipline and the the workflow to use it, cut it, and publish it again and again and again. So this is one thing you're talking about. Oh, sorry, you were going to say something. Uh no, no. I was just gonna. No, I was just gonna. Yeah. Yeah, and and you also uh, were talking about the the budget of uh, putting captions and producing the content and everything. What we see is uh, tiny um, tiny influencers that that don't have the budget to to dub or to create captions or create subtitles in different languages to to reach different demographics, uh, as you were uh, talking about earlier. Um, and we see on the other side professional companies. For sure. uh, professional creators that do have the budget. Sure. And um, the thing is, it's kind of a double, uh, in French we say a couteau à double tranchant. I don't right. know, double- Double-edged sword, cutting. double edged sword. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a double edged sword because you want your content to be viewed and interacted with as fast as you can as a small influencer or a small yep. video uh, content producer. And just by putting captions in the original language that you are, uh, producing the content will almost double your views, will increase by at least 50% your views right away. So after that, if you um, put subtitles in different languages, you will reach a, a broader uh, audience, that's for sure. Right. Uh, but I think that the first step would be to create uh, captions in the original language. Uh, but there is something else that we have to, to, to talk about or think about, automated captions. I made a research using, I don't know if you know, uh, Google uh, Consumer Surveys, but you can, yep. you can send a, across Canada and US, for example, a Google Consumer Survey to different people. You don't know their industry. They could be like normal consumers or they could be working in different uh, industries. And I, I asked them, if you are watching a video um, <clears throat> that has automated captions and you see too many mistakes, too many errors, will you keep on watching the video put the sound on or stop watching it because it will be annoying to see that many mistakes. And 75% of the people told me they would stop watching the video right away. So quality is important. Quality is so bad. Yeah, yeah quality is if, important. If you read a text written by a seven years old, <laughs> if it's your child, you will read it because you have no choice. <laughs> but you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to read a whole newspaper written by a seven-year-old because True. there are so many mistakes. I mean, you just, it doesn't make sense to read it. So the audience will do the same. It's almost better not to put any captions than to put captions uh, automated with a low quality. So that's why I'm thinking that our industry, the localization industry, mm -hmm. humans and everything, they still have their place. That's right. I mean, we've uh, covered this topic on this channel quite a bit is the um, um, and I would like to get Pierre Benoit's uh, vision on this one in terms of machine and human working together. So obviously technology is evolving in your industry and in your in your segment of the industry and the rest of the segments of the localization industry. Um, and so and, and I know you have 5000 freelancers you mentioned earlier logging into your system contributing, etc. 
do you see a role or how does this play in your world when it comes to um, you know the um, uh, the chat GTP kind of a kind of an environment and your uh, manual process. So where does manual process begin ends? Are they merging? Where do you see the future? That's a very valid question, uh, Robin. So what you have to know is that at this point, what we do is, and we can talk about ratios, but the transcription part. We have not seen any solutions that are close to being able to offer a speech to text that would make the human uh, taken out 100% of the equation. We have humans transcribe the content, listen, transcribe, then they go through, then there's an automated process for all the formatting. So our technology does take away 50% of the time, then, you know, classic subtitle companies that have people in an office doing uh, subtitles for a movie, for instance, we automate 50% with our scripts, with our technology in the back end. Um, and the fact is, is, and we're always trying different solutions. The reality is that for fast paced videos with many people speaking, only the human ear is able to decipher the context, uh, who spoke when a machine cannot do it. So obviously we know that we're like a tech enabled service, but we still provide that human, inter that human part of the work. But what we've done is we've brought this at scale. So we're able to deliver volumes because of our scale and our reach in different languages that any normal subtitling company could not do. Mm -hmm. Um, so we took a, an archaic business and brought it online. So we have reached mm -hmm. from, you know, different orders can come in from anywhere in the world. And we also have a dispatch platform that can do the work. And we fragment, yeah. we have all these processes in place to one, there's the time to market, like David uh, spoke, spoke about saying that video must be, uh, subtitles need to be received quickly in order to be able to monetize this video online. So we're able to deliver videos on an average time uh, subtitles in seven hours. That's what I was going to ask you, like uh, the advantage. Uh, what are your advantages versus other uh, transcription uh, companies out there? And we know a few of them. You and I talked about those large competition that with yours. Uh, you must offer some unique and, I, you know, in, in based on surveys. And if you look at surveys alone, uh, every customer is different, obviously. But uh, surveys tells us that price is not in our in our industry price is ranked number three on the uh, much important to the market uh turnaround time to, you know incidentally happened to be number one and quality number two and price is number three uh but you know when you talk to various entrepreneurs in our industry and you look at what's going on in the industry with people talking about commoditization and you know how price pressure and how things are dropping in terms of our rates um, you know, that tells a different story than what the data is telling us. The data is telling us, you know, we should, the prices should be rising. The important, the importance are the deliverables, which they are, you know, on time delivery. People want their jobs on time done, no delays. And time to market is very essential, very important time to market, because if you're not in the market, that means you're losing money as a customer. And the second thing is the quality. Um, both of you, can you react to that? So for uh, us... The, the three points that you put, I say we layer them together because we're at a very affordable price. We deliver quality and we develop, deliver it. We're the fastest in the market. That's the best sales pitch I ever heard. You know, yeah. get it cheap, good quality. <laughs> right. and on time, that, that's the, that's the reality, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's reality. Trying to, uh, and we it's have different, different price tiers for different quality levels, but whether you take a higher quality level or not, the delivery time is the same. Okay. So we layer the three together and we do it at scale. Excellent. So we, I'm glad. Uh, if, and if you don't have a job with David and uh, based on that sales pitch alone, I'm just, uh, just about yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> I can, but I can tell you what, what I'm hearing from clients, you know, yeah. uh, we have big clients, serious clients that, that want quality uh, and they, they want speed. So for, for them, the price is a bit less uh, important, as you said earlier. Uh, but I've been speaking also to ex-clients that even if we deliver within four or five hours, when they, they finish their video editing, they already need the captions right away. I mean, 
not in four hours, not in seven hours. They need it right away. So then they have no choice but to do it themselves. It's already uh, five minutes to midnight. They have to deliver the video right away. So so speed for them is more uh, important. Uh, they, 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 they would pay more, but I mean, it's it's really hard to deliver a service, and an instant service of quality. So there are these two um, two different business models. The ones that, that produce the video and need it right away, the ones that, that want quality uh, above uh, the price. And there's also these small companies that at any price, it's too expensive for them. That's right. You, That's right. you, you know, it exists. It could, be, right. it could be all sizes of companies, uh, let's be honest. It could be That's like right. the freelancer that, that produces their own videos. It could be the small agency that already pay um, a, a clerk or a video editor and tell them, well, you know what? I'm already paying you. Please write the captions and make the translation yourself. So there are these three uh, business types that we have to, uh, to work with. And it's, it's always very hard to find the, the good, um, the good, the good balance. Point. Yeah, balance. yeah, the good balance. But that's why right now what we do is we have, we have different prices for different qualities and different prices for different delivery speeds. Mm -hmm. So then if someone wants a higher quality, very, very fast, it's going to be more expensive. And yep. if someone doesn't have much money to spend and maybe they're not in a rush at all, it's going to be less expensive. So we try to offer the three. It's impossible to be really, really cheap and deliver instant and have <laughs> the highest quality possible. But yeah, we try to adapt to everything. David, we call it we call it the two out of three rule, right? The two out of three rule. So uh, you can pick two out of three. <laughs> cheap, exactly. You know, um, um, cheap, low quality, cheap quality, or uh, fast. fast. So pick two yeah. out of three, and you know the people who claim, and I that's been my experience, to do all three together. I you know I, I kudo to them if they can do it or they can achieve. Um, I, I would, you know, they should be patented in my opinion, yeah. <laughs> but we're lucky. We're lucky to live, uh, today, you know, because there are two new things that help us, um, trying to achieve those three things at the same time, globalization of the, of the people, of the workers. Now Correct. we're able to hire people everywhere in the world yeah. uh, to do different kinds of jobs that might cost less to produce and also <laughs> technology. And we are, uh, strong believers into um, enable our humans to work with a better, always better technology to mm -hmm. deliver better quality in a faster time. So that's why, like Gabano said earlier, we, each day we try to see, okay, what can we improve in our technology? You know, you have the humans, you cannot change the humans. Humans, they, they hear well or not, they, they do mistakes. It's mm -hmm. like they're imperfect. So what tools can we provide them so that we deliver faster at a higher quality. And this is a, a, a battle we are uh, working on every single day. Uh, we're, we're lucky. So improving the technology is uh, one of your main goals, uh, I would say, to do things more effectively in the organization in terms of quality, in terms of fast turnaround. Um, technology is uh, the cornerstone in your business beside the people who are uh, and the res human resources who is helping you do do the work. I mean, you got to have that yeah. technology foundation to allow you to do what you do. How many engineers, and talk to me a little bit about your IT structure. Are, are you doing the development internally? Uh, is this outsourced? How many engineers you have and how you structured internally on the development side? Because I'm assuming that's a continuous uh, a continuous process. That's not a uh, that's not a shot in shot in time. Basically, we develop the product and off we go. This is something that is continuously happening, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but do you want to elaborate on that? Absolutely. Um, so when we started, David was doing everything. Uh, now we <laughs> that's have, the starting point. <laughs> the, the way we're set up, Robin, is that David now just oversees all the technical technological advancement. We have a head of IT to whom three, pro, three full-time programmers reports to. Our head, okay. the, our head of IT also programs things in the platform and it's twofold. So we have new developments, so new features we're putting into our dashboards, putting into the, the way people, you know, the, the transcription screen, the corrector. So that's the development side. And then we have the other side, which is more technical support. 
because there's always something client requests, different file format. Uh, so we're well geared in order to put these things into place, uh, but always under the supervision of our founder and CTO. David. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, Robin, at the beginning, in the, the first weeks, sorry, uh, Pierre, not to interrupt, no, but at the, in the first weeks of the business and first months, we were working on YouTube's uh, captioning tool. So uh, it, it has evolved a lot since then. But we understand that we, if we are using someone else's tools, we might not be able to uh, improve them that much. So that's why at one point we decided to build our, our own tools so that our team can use it. Mm -hmm. And then we can check this, this, uh, the speed at which they type. We can Push. check how they work, what, what keys they are hitting, what common mistakes they do. And we can start from that and evolve the tools and improve them every single week. So you rely on data, basically. By collecting data, you rely on it to make sure that you're making decisions to the future in terms of performance and, uh, and, and, and uh, the attribute of your software to be always being on the development side of things to be, to be better, right? Um, which brings me to uh, the next question. It's about the future. So, you know, you've started a company, you've seen an accelerated growth from day one, you're developing a software now, things are happening for your organization. Uh, what's the uh, five-year, 10-year vision for your organization uh, in terms of, you know, people, tools, products, uh, services, from whatever angle you want to address that? Sure. Well, we see a huge growth in languages other than French. The reality, Robin, is that we started with French captions um, and have developed that market. And now phase two of the plan is to market and sell our services in other languages. Um, we currently, I think, seven languages, David. Yeah, we do. So right now we do, we do, we started with French as there was a need in the market and I had the need myself. Uh, but then our French client asked us, would you do uh, Brazilian Portuguese? Would you do Spanish, English, Hindi, Korean, uh, Italian? So uh, we did also Dutch and we did a bit of German too. So we are able right now to deliver services into these languages. And if you are a technical person, Robin, and I don't know how much you are, but I um, being able to have softwares that can um, uh, process characters like accented yep. letters in different languages, or, you know, in German, you have this, this strange S like this. So these, these are extended uh, character sets. And since we, almost since day one, uh, had to, to work with these characters and different languages, uh, our platform right now allows us to, to, to do them all and to add new languages too. So as Gabon said, future for us is certainly these markets as we already delivered services into these markets, but we have never addressed and sold in these markets. I'll let you okay. continue, Pierre Benoit. No, and phase two is we have a great tool now that we've developed for the actual captioning. So uh, David and I have spoken, and uh, it's a development to uh, license our software to other companies mm -hmm. that have their own task teams within them and that want to use a software that's you know <clears throat> semi-automated by tech where all their formatting would be taken into place and they would just do the transcription. And, you know, as the speech to text improves, we'll, we start using layers of it in order to mm -hmm. automate the maximum. But the reality is these, the formatting is as important as the actual transcription. So we're going to automate both of this. And so the timing, more. and I'm assuming in the time and the timing on the video too, because you want to make sure that yes. the captioning line up with the timing timestamp on an on a, on a on a video, correct? Yeah, and that's something that's already we have developed the technology that would that helps all that, and that's something that takes a tremendous amount of times in a standard captioning company. You know, congratulations to you too. Like, I mean, this is a great idea, great innovation that you guys have started and launched, and um. And in, over no time, literally took off for you guys. Uh, you hit the right market at the right time. 
and with the right solution, I say, and that's the three three keys to success, timing and the opportunity to solve a problem and a customer that is willing to be um, approached toward solving these problems by paying to solve the problem, to create a business, obviously. So um, congratulations again. Now, how do you see, um, and you know, I, lots of talk in the industry, and, and, and I've talked about it on this channel many times, is that there's a lot of technology coming up, artificial intelligence, chat TPT, uh, machine, machine translation, and a bunch of other things. Where do you guys see all this in regards to your business? If there is any impact at all, maybe it's not, I don't know. Such, such an interesting question, Robin. I drive a Tesla myself with the autopilot. Have you ever used it? I driven a Tesla before. I don't own one, but I've driven a Tesla before, yes. Uh, have you tried the autopilot feature? I did. I did. Okay. It's, it's an interesting one. Yes. You got to yeah, keep an eye is. on it. I don't trust it. <laughs> you, you, you've said it right. Okay. So thing is with art, artificial intelligence, we have hallucinations. And um, when I say it's not, we have hallucinations. It has hallucinations. It will tell you facts that are not real. Like if, it, if they were real. So my philosophy on artificial intelligence and speech to text and all the technologies like that, is that it's better to have them, them provoked, uh, triggered by a human than having a human to correct them. Why do I say that? If you drive your Tesla on autopilot and you, you have the, the hand on the wheel, if, if the, you, want, you want to change lanes, you want to turn right or left, or you want to do um, anything, you, you can do it. But if you let the car drive by itself and you go on the passenger seat, and you're asleep there, yeah. it, it will be too late to correct a mistake. Yeah. Thing is, <clears throat> with the speech to text and other AIs, uh, it would write words that are simply incorrect. Correct. And when you try to correct that, uh, there are some errors that you miss. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like if you have to correct the text that I will write myself, I'm a human, I write the text, I write the first paragraph perfectly. So you have your task is to correct what I do. You read my first paragraph, you say, oh, this guy has a good hand, uh, good writing. He doesn't make any mistakes. And then your brain starts disconnecting from trying to search all the errors. Or it could be totally the opposite. I could be writing like an eight-year-old. And you could try to correct all the mistakes that I do. But I do so many that at the end, you don't see them all because there are so many. So I prefer and my, my view on that is I prefer having the AI used as a tool triggered by humans mm -hmm. than having AI fixed by a human that can himself do mistakes so, and not see which, them all. Yeah. yeah, which brings me to the next question, which actually obviously it's an obvious question, is that, as you know, every technology is it's got some maturity and uh, we are, I think uh, we are in the uh, floor levels of artificial intelligence maturity. I mean, it's still have ways to go. Uh, in your opinion, is it a, a matter of training? Uh, the, a, the artificial intelligence is learning now. And I don't know, like you and I could be looking back in five years from now and, you know, we see artificial intelligence, cybernetics, uh, you know, ruling, <clears throat> ruling, ruling the world. I don't know the answer to that. In your opinion, is it not trained well enough at this stage to do what a human needs to do? And I know it's a philosophical question. I don't know. It is. <laughs> it could be, uh, I, should, I, I would be a fool to, to, to say that my view is the right one. And I know exactly what the future will like to look like. But I can tell you that when my dad uh, purchased a digital scanner, uh, in the late 90s, uh, there was already a OCR technology that would recognize the characters and convert a letter that you would scan, convert it to a Word document in text. And even at that time, this software was imperfect, but it was the first one of our, our kind of artificial intelligence to convert something into something that is usable on the computer. And even today, this technology is still imperfect and it's like 30, almost 30 years old Correct. right now, 20 something Correct. years old. Um, if you have ever managed a IT development project, mm -hmm. you know that reaching from zero to 90% completion is very, or kind of easy. But for the night, it's, 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 for some reason, it's, it's always- 10%? <laughs> 
Yeah, the last 10% is the hardest. It's <laughs> always right. the hardest. That's right. So it would take you two months to reach 90% and then maybe five years from 90 to 98%. So That's right. being perfect is the hardest thing in the world. That's for sure. And until then, we, we need humans. That's right. And you know, we're, I, and I wrote a blog on this one. Uh, people can reach out and uh, search it on my blog post, uh, robinayub.blog. And I wrote a blog on the coexistence between a machine and human. Uh, we always going to be have mm -hmm. to get used to the environment of, you know, we are working with uh, intelligence, uh, machine intelligence, like software, computers, etc. And some places we have to give room to the machine and some places we have to intervene and correct what the machine is doing but it's it's going to be not, it's not going to be either or it has to be that environment that we coexist between uh software and human is going to be around us for many many years to come yeah and there's something really really hard to do i read an article in the, the newspaper la presse uh, one week ago and they asked uh, chat gpt to act as a tower guide in montreal to say, okay, go to that restaurant to eat that thing. Uh, go to this monument. And hey, here is the history of this this person that has a statue there. And um, well, of course, it would do mistakes with the uh, opening hours of the restaurants or things like that. That's obvious. But the most dangerous thing, thing in my point of view, is when uh, this chat GPT robot says, this guy... He is a war hero. He has done that thing in the 18th or 19th century while all of this was completely false. It's wrong. <laughs> it's completely wrong. It was all invented by ChatGPT based on I don't know what, and it was completely wrong. But if you are a tourist, you don't know that it, it is wrong. You're if getting you the wrong information. That, that's it. <clears throat> so you cannot really trust it. You have to know more about the subject Correct. Then the tool itself. And but this is a hard thing. But you know what's impressive, though? I mean, I, I get it. There's a lot of faults and mistakes at this point right now. You can't take it as, as it is. You have to work with it and modify it and correct it. But what's impressive is the uh, speed of learning. This these machines are, you know, this software is learning. And I've tried I've tried ChatGPT a couple of times just to see if it how it learns and how it behaves based on my own, you know, user experience. And it seems to learn. Like if I give it, you know, uh, I like this writing style or I like this composition of a sentence, um, it seems to adapt quickly to it. If I say to it, okay, write me a little paragraph on subject A. I don't like your way you've written this. Can you modify to, you know, include these types of facts or I modify this? It learns that. And the next time I give it a, a certain topic, it sort of take what I gave it in the past and adapt adapt to it. I'm, I'm impressed with the speed of learning. How fast is this thing learning to behave or to accommodate us as, as a human in terms of what we give it in terms of input? Do you see, Robin, uh, one day, and it, I, again, it's a philosophical question. Do you see one day where you won't be, you won't have to answer your emails, and you can let Chat GPT answer them all without you overlooking it? Do you see one day it will happen? No, it won't be. But it will answer eighty percent of your emails. I would, I would imagine uh, there will be twenty percent of your emails. You will have to answer them yourself. The eighty twenty rule. I love that rule. In everything mm -hmm. we do in life, eighty twenty rule. I think it would apply. You're right when you said you know ninety percent of the project gets done. That last last ten that last ten percent mile. That last mile goes forever. If you're building a house and you're building a house and <clears> you did everything and I know, I know when we did the house renovation in our house, my wife kept on nagging me. They still have a, you know, a few items here not corrected. And those lasted for a couple of years. I haven't done them. So, but eventually I got them done because, you know, I have to do them. <laughs> the, the problem is in the nineties, I was working for a company. Uh, I won't mention the name right now. I was a, uh, a database architect for them. We wrote a program to read emails and dissect the email based on certain keywords within the email example you know a customer's checking on their order so the uh, the logic the computer the software we uh, we were using unix at the time and those are I, i'm dating myself right now as the platform we we're using at the time so <laughs> the email program would write would read the email look for keywords order number customer customer name and it would dip into the database check on the order status compose an email which we was pre-written in the program and it will send the email back to the customer that's in the 90s and it, to be exact, 1995, 1996 timeframe. We've gone a quite a bit ahead of that. And now 
you're right. Back to your question. I don't imagine a situation where like the Tesla model, you know, would solve 100% of the human. Humans are complex and you're not going to find a machine to mimic a human 100%. But I tell you, for those repetitive tasks, yes, a uh, machine can replace. And what if, what if your wife asks you in an email, can I buy this $1,500 dress? And then the email answers yes. And then your kid asks you, can I take your car tonight? And then the script uh, replies yes, but without knowing that you need the car or you don't want your, your kid to drive it because uh, it's an expensive car. So these then, are cases that... For sure. Yeah, I mean, those are debates that we can have them. And I love, the, I love that debate that we're having today because those are fundament, fundamental questions. No, you bring up a very imp interesting questions. If this is how we are going to behave as technology and human coexist in the same environment, there got to be some control, as you mentioned earlier, that, you know, that indicator that a human is in control is I want to give the ability, I want to dictate to the machine, look, if my son is asking, he's underage, I know, because he's not, you know, 18 yet, he's going to ask him to drive a car, <clears throat> the answer is no. If, you know, the minute limit spending on my credit card is $500, if my wife wants to spend $1,500, I'm going to, you know, the answer is no, or default back to me to answer it. So <laughs> those kinds of things need to be programmed. Yeah, but yeah. It, it is hard. The, the, uh, it would be interesting to see what happens in the future with that technology. That's Absolutely, obvious. Yeah. 100%. There's a lot of potential for it, but it needs to be shaped. Yeah. It needs to be guided. It needs to be customized to each individual's needs and wants and, and behavior. Um, I guess we're coming up on the hour. I got a, a, a couple more questions for you. One specific one is, um, where do you see us? Where do you see your organization going from here? What's the your next five-year goals? What do you like to achieve? Just to wrap it up. And if customers or audience on this channel wants to reach you out, uh, reach out to you, how do they do it? What, what avenues would they uh, go to engage with you? What do they need to do? David? Oh, sure, I'll take it. So as, as I said a bit earlier, uh, David, uh, Robin, uh, our plan is really to grow by being a multi-language solution. Um, whether it be with key partnerships on big accounts and then do what we call our smaller accounts that are, you know, video agencies from across the world. Um, we can work on majors and uh, have our technology evolve, you know, faster than the pace of technology, the, the average technology in this domain. Um, for us, translation of um, of subtitles or multi-language subtitles on the same video is a key aspect that we do offer but have not yet marketed. So, you know, our plan for the next five years is really growth via client acquisition, via improving quality and selling a better service, better product than our competitors. And in order to reach us, uh, while we're happy, we can be reached via phone, email. Um, Robin, I'm sure you have the information. They can. Yeah, we'll include your information in the bio here and the uh, video descriptions by the end of this uh, by the end of this video. Um, I want to thank uh, my friends David and uh, Pierre Benoit for joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the relationship that we've I've known you guys for a couple of years now. I enjoy our conversation every time we get together. It's a thought provoking one, that's for sure. And I always look forward to the next conversation. So, I your your friends of this channel, I welcome you anytime. You have a brand new idea or brand new innovation you want to tell the world about. I hope you choose me or choose this channel to tell your story. And this is what what this is about is telling the story of an individual or individuals. Uh, who are involved in the localization industry. So thank you again. Thanks for being part of my, uh, this conversation this morning. Thank you very, thank you much. very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.